Scott Reeves, welcome again. Thank you, David. Tell us what you do in the museum. Um, I'm the collection manager humanities at the museum, so my role is very much a back of house one, looking after the collections and storage, looking after the information around those collections and providing access to them in heaps of different ways. Back of house tours, researchers, um, getting them ready to go out on loan to other institutions, that sort of thing. So that interplay between institutions goes on, of course. Yeah, quite a bit. The, um, for example, we've recently lent a, an outfit, a motoring outfit, to the Hocken for one of their exhibitions. Yeah. Yep. So, so you, Ash, you don't guard things particularly jealously anymore. No, no, not at all. We're very open. Um, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time collaborating yeah. with our, our sister institutions. Mm. So what have you brought here today? I've brought a group of items from the northwest coast of North America, mostly up around Canada, um, made by the Haida people, um, mostly around, in fact all of these were made on what used to be called the Queen Charlotte Islands, now known as Haida Gwaii. So islands, lots of trees? Lots of trees, yeah. Lots of um, Spruce and sequoia and all that sort of That's right, yeah, cedar, um, cedar and yeah. the people are renowned woodcarvers. I mean, to the, to the extent where, when you think of Native American art, you think of totem poles first, maybe, mm. but totem poles are very much just a northwest coast art form. And in fact, not even all across the northwest coast. The Haida, the um, Simshan, people like that, are the, the Tlinga, are um, the masters of that art. And it's kind of all pervasive across the idea of northwest. Yes, they were spectacularly good artists, weren't they? And even to the European eye. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The the art form itself, the way the, the it's called form line, the way that the, the spaces are filled in the work, like for example the um, the sea lion on the halibut club there. Um, that's this object. Yes, that's here. this one here. Just the way that the, the space is filled out with decoration, um, the way that they'd wrap and unwrap animals across their um, paintings especially. And you can see wonderful examples of that in our gallery, for example, a bent wood bowl in our People of the World Gallery. They also used quite a lot more colour than we've got evident here in these. Yeah, they did. So, I mean, um, almost like Māori art, the, the main colour palette were whites, blacks and reds, and they're very, very vibrant, very, yeah, easily distinguished and unrecognisably um, hider, really. They're, yeah, gorgeous pieces. So, and they've incorporated many of their symbols, of course, very important symbols like the raven. That's right. And there's the bear, we think, and wolves, all sorts of the... Yeah. The, um, the raven was very significant to them. Yeah, the raven and the eagle would be probably the two most significant creatures in, in their mythology, in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, the Haida live as a group of families and, and villages and groups of lineages that all go back to either the raven or the eagle. So each, each Haida person is related to one of those two animals. Um, and that lineage goes down through the mother's side. So if your mother was, was a raven, you were a raven. But of course, how did how did the Otago Museum come by these? In a variety of ways, um, the large uh, the larger of the spoons there uh, came to us in the 1950s from a as a donation actually from a Christchurch dealer. Um, most of the other pieces on the table here actually come from the American Museum of Natural History, and an exchange in 1919 that we did between the two institutions. Um, I recently visited there actually and had a look at the pieces that we we exchanged with them and have been contacting them for a bit more information on these pieces. They're um, probably from an expedition that Franz Boas did up into the northwest coast and into Alaska. But these, these uh, late 19th, 20th century? What, yeah, probably. What's I think, their age? Uh, none of them are earlier than World War I. Um, I would say the spoons would be quite a bit older. The argillite carving um, here is probably no later than sort of 1870s, no earlier than 1870s, 1880s, which is when that art form really started to come out as a, as a trade with, um, with Europeans. So in a sense it's trade and in a sense it's tourism. And, and there's a, yeah. The, there is the sort of split. The, they're, yeah. they're selling objects that they know they can sell. Yeah, the Haida were, um, were voracious traders very early on and, and for a start it was sea otter and seal furs and mm -hmm. things like that, but as that fur trade declined, um, fortunately, they kept enough of the old carving skills alive that when they started to work that argillite for trade, they could bring some of those, um, those skills into play and it really kept the, the culture and the, the meaning of their um, totem animals and things alive.
they seem to have included a lot of symbolism and even a small piece of argillite like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you pointed out, we've got a bear at the top oh. and ravens and all sorts of figures, yeah, and even more so on the spoons. Um, so, a figure like this one. These, um, these were owned by families and often they'll be the same figures that were on the family totem, so outside the house. And um, here we have a wolf, you can see his hands here. Um, and seated above him is what's known as a watchman figure, which is often an ancestor or a spiritual guardian. There'd usually be two or three at least of these on a totem pole. Um, this one's a woman, and we can tell that because she's got a labrette in her bottom lip. So if we compare it to one of the other ones, you can see the bottom lip's quite yeah. protruded yeah. there. Yeah. Are these two different types of horn, would it? Yes, they are. Um, so on the bottom, we've got a sheep horn which has been carved and then boiled and bent around into the form of the base of the spoon, and a mountain goat horn on the top, neither of which you really get on the islands where they were, so they were trading with other tribes for the raw materials to, to do, these, do these spoons. Would such an object have been in daily use or just something to, to more decorative, I suppose? No, yeah, something more very... Sim so, yeah, more symbolism. Something very special. These are the um, these are the fine silver that you get out for your ceremonies. So these mm. were used in potlatch ceremonies um, for the raising of a totem pole or a birth or a death or a marriage, that sort of thing. So potlatch was a very expensive business, I imagine. You had to virtually give all for the community. Yeah, and actually outlawed by the Canadian government in the 1800s yeah. for, for many years. Yeah, I think a lot of it still went on. But yeah, probably where we get the word potluck from, actually. Oh, there we are. Well... Our luck was that you brought these objects to show us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. They're quite beautiful.